So let me introduce Jim Tumlinson. Dr. Tumlinson is the 2015 recipient of the Sterling B. Hendrick Memorial Lectureship Award as recognition for his discoveries in chemical ecology of plant herbivore parasitic wasp interactions in agricultural ecosystems. This has led to a fundamental understanding of the complete tritrophic system, including foraging behavior of parasitoids, herbivore plant signaling, and plant natural enemy chemical communication. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the Entomological Society of America. We're pleased to have Jim speak with us. Jim? Thank you, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, chemical ecology as a field of study or field of research is probably only about 50 or 60 years old. We started isolating and identifying and synthesizing insect pheromones back in the 60s and eventually that's evolved into a oh, greater scope of, of study. Um, the field was actually jump-started by the discovery of the and isolation and identification of the pheromone of the domesticated silk moth by Butendot in 1959 <laughs> and he isolated and identified this 16 carbon compound which he named Bombicol and this actually pointed the way, introduced the, the use of analytical chemistry and actually showed that chemists could be involved in ecological studies. Subsequent to that, Rachel Carlson published her book in the spring, Solid Spring in 1962, pointing out the dangers of pesticides to the environment and to human health and the need to develop systems that were alternatives to pesticides and this really gave a great impetus to the study of both chemical ecology and biological control. Now initially <coughs> we were studying, we isolated, nearly all the first chemical ecology uh, investigations involved the isolation, identification, and synthesis of insect pheromones with the idea that we could use these pheromones to attract and control uh, pest herbivores, pest insects. This cartoon was, was uh, drawn by my good friend and colleague Jim Minyard when we were working on the boll weevil pheromone at, at uh, the USDA ARS boll weevil lab in Mississippi State, <coughs> Starkville, Mississippi. And this would just, just sort of illustrates our initial idea of how this field would go, that we would isolate and identify these chemicals which are powerful attractants for the insects because they regulate in mating and reproduction. And this would make the farmer's life a lot easier. He could just sit on his front porch and wiggle his big toe and kill all the insects that were attracted to the pheromone. Of course, that's not quite right, but we were successful in identifying, <laughs> isolating and identifying and synthesizing the four components of the boll weevil sex pheromone. And this was usually later used in, the trap, in traps as part of, as one of the key components of the system that was used to eradicate the boll weevil from the United States and had a great impact on the pesticide usage, reducing pesticide use on cotton and increased production, cotton production in the southeastern considerably. So in effect we didn't make the life of the cotton farmer a lot easier by identifying this pheromone. <coughs> and pheromones have been used in traps since then to monitor, <coughs> to monitor uh, insect populations and in some cases for controlling. But while we were doing this, uh, Professor Harry Shorey at the University of California Riverside came up with another idea and this was really a creative, innovative idea that Harry developed and his idea was instead of trapping the insects, let's just confuse them. And so what he did was he distributed the pheromone throughout the field, or in this case uh, it's showing an orchard so with dispensers in every tree and releasing the pheromone and so much so that the males essentially cannot find the females for mating. So this is called mating disruption or communication disruption. And this has been quite successful over the years in controlling insects, particularly in orchards and vineyards. And this is a <coughs> slide that provided to me by Jim Miller at Michigan State just showing the, uh, the progression and the European grape berry moth starting in about 1992 and going up to 2001 showing that 
the pesticide uses has been reduced considerably at the same time uh, and to compensate for that the surface treated with, been treated with, with pheromones and mating disruption program and subsequently the insect damage has, has been reduced much more than it was when pesticides were in use. So this has been very effective and it's been used throughout the world and other in several different species like the uh, codling moth and some orchard, other orchard, oriental fruit moth and other orchard pests. And this is an indicator. This graph just shows you here that the uh, just from 2000 from 2000 to 2012 there was a 75 percent increase in this type of of uh, control of using pheromone communication disruption to control control pest insects. But there's a lot more going on in the nature than just the communication of uh, the chemicals pheromones used to by insects to communicate and to attract mates. And in fact, as this slide shows, this was drawn by Peter Price and published in 1981. There's a great number of interactions between plants, herbivores that feed on the plants, natural enemies that attack the herbivores, and even hyperparasitoids that attack the natural enemies. And all these interactions have some component of chemical communication or chemical regulation. All these interactions are regulated by chemical cues to enable the herbivores to find the plants or determine which plants are their host plants and so forth and allow the parasitoids of the natural enemies to find the herbivores. Actually one thing that Peter didn't put in here, I, but at that time it wasn't known about it, there are also interactions from plant to plant as you will see as I go on later on in, the, in this presentation. So. Chemical cues play a major role in mediating all sorts of interactions among organisms in the field, and these have a great potential for use to help us control pest insects. <laughs> well, in the 1970s, uh, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, biological control with beneficial insects was became very popular, and there were a lot of uh, major efforts to use these little wasps and raise them, rear them in large numbers and release them in the field to control the pests. But the problem, one of the problems was that sometimes it was successful and sometimes it wasn't. <laughs> and so Joe Lewis and I started working in this field in the early 80s and we asked the question, how does that little wasp find its host in a field like this? If you consider a cotton field where the, the host insects are not distributed evenly over the whole field, how does it find the host and the, and the insects, uh, the caterpillars are not up on top of the leaves where they're easily seen, they're down under the leaves. How do they do that? Well, in fact, they do it, they're very good at it. This just shows you, this uh, uh, an ex as an example, here's a, a pest right here, a caterpillar right here, and the wasp can home in on it and find that, and they're very effective at doing this. But as I said, sometimes it works and sometimes it didn't. So we wanted to know how this system works. And we spent a number of years investigating this. And to make a long story rather short, basically what happens is when a caterpillar feeds on, on a plant and chews on the plant, there are a list of substances in the spit of the caterpillar that interact with the damaged tissues of the plant. And these substances can, uh, induce the plant to synthesize and release volatile organic compounds. And these are signals that the natural enemies pick up and use as cues, host location cues, to find their, their host larvae. So these, the plant signal is a volatile organic compounds are attracting the natural enemies to attack, to locate and attack the herbivores that are feeding on the plant. And it turns out this is very effective. Now, as you might imagine, there are a lot of chemicals produced by plants, and this just shows you all the systems we use to collect and, uh, and uh, for identification, collect volatile organic compounds from a plant for identification. We put it in a glass cylinder here like this and we, we can do the part of this slide is, is we can collect volatile organic compounds from intact living plants that insects are feeding on, which is much more realistic than doing things like we were done in the old days where you went out and collected plants in the field and chopped them down and brought them in. This is working with live plants. So basically by doing this and sweeping the air down over the plant and sucking the, the volatiles out through the little filter traps and then analyzing them by GC, 
we can get some idea of what's happening when a plant's being fed on by insects. When we do that, we find that there are a large number of volatile organic compounds that are released by plants. And this just gives you some idea of the different classes. Some of the, you know, the greatest number of compounds and probably the, um, the majority of them are, are in the terpenoid class. The monoterpenes, which have 10 carbons, the sesquiterpenes, 15 carbons, and then some of these homoterpenes, which have 11 or 16 carbons. But also another pathway is involved, and this is a shikimic acid pathway, which produces things like endo, and then the lipoxygenase pathway, which produces the green leafy volatiles, which have the odor of green leaves. It's the odor you, you smell if you mow your grass or when you're, if you crush a leaf. These are not all the compounds that are produced by plants when they're fed on herbivores. There are some other ones, sulfur-containing compounds and others that I'm not included here, but this just gives you an idea that there's a vast array of compounds that the plants have that they can release in order to repel insects or attract insects or have some of actually deter uh, pathogens. So if you think about this, though, it's highly unlikely that uh, all plants will produce the same compounds. We wouldn't, we wouldn't think that because we know the different flowers have different odors. And this is just an example showing that if you put the corn earworm larvae on soybeans, cowpeas, or cotton, you get very different odors produced by the same caterpillar feeding on different plants. So different plants produce different odors. Okay. So basically, different plants fed on even by the same insect produce different blends of odors, and this is to be expected. What I wasn't quite ready for, <coughs> although uh, probably it was more, uh, it would have, people who work on plants more than I do would have expected it, is that different varieties or different ecotypes of the same plants produce different blends of volatiles when they're fed on by insect herbivores. And this just shows you some cotton varieties. These four varieties are, were varieties that were planted for commercial cotton production in the southeastern U.S. when we did this work in the mid-90s. And these volatiles here are from a plant uh, from, grown from seed that was collected from a plant found growing wild in the Everglades. So it had naturalized into the Everglades. <clears throat> and you can see that when it was fed on by beet armyworms, you got this, these types of blends from the domestic varieties, but this naturalized variety produced eight, five to eight times the quantity of volatiles and also <clears throat> a different ratio of volatiles than the, um, than the domesticated varieties, or the ones that had not naturalized. So this is an indication that the plants have a rather great capacity to defend themselves and to attract natural enemies and in fact the, the caterpillars didn't really like to feed on this plant. We had to keep, they kept crawling off and we had to keep putting them back on. But the, so they didn't get nearly as much damage as, as these plants that were uh, grown commercially. So this is an indication that perhaps we've lost something <coughs> in terms of the ability of the plant to produce lots of volatiles or to defend itself when they, the crops have been bred for production rather than considering the natural defense mechanisms of the plants. Cotton is an interesting plant because it and the and the cotton leaf it had the little I hope you can see this little black dots here are glands. It has glands in the cotton leaf. <coughs> and these glands are loaded with terpenes. So the the plant actually synthesizes these compounds and stores them in these little glands and when a caterpillar feeds on the plant, breaks those glands and releases volatile organic compounds. <clears throat> and these, these volatiles that are, these are the terpenes that are stored in the glands on the cotton that we looked at. And here you see the monoterpenes like alpha pinene, beta pinene, myrcene, and limonene, and then some sesquiterpenes. But also the plant synthesizes and releases compounds de novo. These compounds are not stored in glands, but when the caterpillar feeds on the plant, the plant synthesizes these essentially immediately and releases them in the air. So you get not only the stored compounds, but the induced compounds. Now the thing is, if you set up that apparatus I showed you earlier, and you put a cotton plant in it, and you put caterpillars on it, and in this case it beat army worms, 
and you collect volatiles every hour, every three hours for around the clock for three days, you get a pattern that looks like this. This yellow line is representing the production of alpha pinene or the release of alpha pinene by the plant, and you can see it's released day and night. These just you're looking at the nighttime here, middle of the day, and next night, the next middle of the day, and so forth, and it's produced basically. Um, depending on how much the caterpillar is feeding day and night throughout the whole period of three days until, in fact, there's a very little plant surf, leaf surface left. But these other compounds that are synthesized de novo that are not stored in glands are released not during the nighttime but during the daytime when the light's on. And then when it gets dark, they drop off considerably. And then so, so there's, a, there's a temporal difference in the way plants release volatiles. They don't release all the volatiles at the same time and, it, and, and the uh, blend of volatiles changes over time depending on how, what plant it is and how, what insects is feeding on it and so forth and so on. So here again you see a great amount of variability and, and flexibility on the plant's side. This was also demonstrated by Consuela de Mars who was working in my lab. She was looking at tobacco fed on, on by Heliothus fluorescence, a tobacco budworm. And the budworm, the tobacco, during the daytime when the budworm is feeding on it, it releases these volatiles here. This is basically two main peaks, osamine and caryophylline, that attract the natural enemies of the wasp. But at night, these peaks are greatly diminished, and there's other peaks that, that pop up and, and uh, are more prevalent during the nocturnal period. And this just shows you some of the compounds that are produced there, like the terpenes and so forth, and here's some of the esters of the green leafy compounds. And basically what she found is, is these nocturnal insect, nocturnal volatiles actually repel the female moths and prevent them, deter them from depositing eggs on these plants that are being fed on by the, by the caterpillars, by the conspecific caterpillars. And this makes a lot of sense when you think about it because it's not to the advantage of the moth to place their eggs on a, on a plant that's already infested with caterpillars because the chance of her progeny surviving are much diminished. Well, the other thing that Consuela found was she did an experiment in the field with plants in the field and she was looking at the response of cardiac nicriceps. This is a wasp that specializes on Heliothus fluorescens and it does not attack a closely related Helicoverpozea, which also occurs a lot of times simultaneously in the field. And what she found was if she put the plants in the field, with the caterpillars on them and the damage and everything, the wasps could actually tell the difference between plants that were fed on by their hosts, the varicens, and, and the non-host caterpillar, the zea, and most of them would go to the plants that were fed on by varicens. If she took the caterpillars off and just and removed the, the frass and the stuff that the caterpillars had left on the plant, they still, even though the caterpillars weren't on the plant, the wasp still, the natural enemy still preferred the plant was fed on by their host rather than the non-host. And even if she cut off the damaged leaves and just exposed the leaves that were producing volatile systemically, she still found the same thing. So this is an interesting aspect that plants fed on by different herbivores produce different lens of volatiles and that the natural enemies of those herbivores can tell the difference between a plant fed on by their host and a plant fed on by the non-host. And this just shows you the, uh, gives you a bar graph showing the differences in volatiles. Basically, you're seeing the same compounds, but in different proportions and different ratios. So, Sean Halloran, who was a student in my lab, was interested in the lagus bugs. And lagus bugs are, are sometimes a pretty serious pest of cotton, but they also like a, a weed, a weedy plant called Eastern Daisy Fleabane or Erigeron. And what Sean found was that, that just looking at, begin with, just look at the volatiles produced by these two plants. This is an intact, undamaged cotton plant, and this is Erigeron. And you can see that the, this weed produces a huge amount of volatiles, a lot more than the cotton plant. And when the, cat, when the plants are fed on by nymphs of the lagus bugs, you can see they get more volatiles here when the, by nymph damaged cotton than from undamaged cotton. And, but here again, the nymph damaged erigeron produces a huge amount. Now you're up into, you know, 120 
100 to 120 micrograms per 12-hour period for each, for one plant. So basically, this this uh, fleabane or rigeron is producing a huge amount of volatiles, much more than the than the cotton. And the plant and the lichen bugs are found on both. So the question is, which do they like best? And what we found is, is even though the volatiles are not exactly the same, that the the lichen bugs prefer the damaged weed, the origeron, over the damaged cotton, whether it's nymph damage or adult damage or so forth and so on. Even undamaged, they prefer that over that. So they're more likely to be found on these weeds in, uh, which grow in and around the cotton field than they are on the cotton. And more importantly, the natural enemies, these wasps, which are natural enemies of the lagus bug, also prefer the undamaged origeron or the nymph damaged origeron over the cotton. The only time they preferred the cotton over the origeron was if the origeron was not damaged and the cotton was. So this indicates that it might be possible to lure the, the uh, lagus bugs out of the field to, this, to these weeds if you had the weeds planted in or around the cotton field <coughs> and that the wasps, the natural enemies, would find them there much more efficiently and attract them. So Sometimes it might not be a bad idea to have a few of these weeds around your cotton field rather than have it really clean like most farmers like to have it. Well, so would this really work is the question. Is this, is this feasible? In Africa, corn or maize is a very important crop. It's one of the most important food crops there, as it is around the world, actually. And in this, in, in this East Africa in particular, they don't have huge plantations with hundreds or thousands of acres of corn. Usually each far farmer, smallholder, has maybe one or two hectares of corn. And they grow this for their own food and some perhaps that they sell. The problem is there's some serious pests of corn in Africa. One of them is a stem borer moth, which causes 15 to 80 percent losses in maize in sub-Saharan Africa. And the other one is this real pretty weed called striga. It has a nice pretty purple bloom on it, but it's devastating to a crop. It can cause 100% losses in maize and sorghum in this Eastern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. So these are major problems for the African farmers who don't have a lot of money to buy pesticides or have, have high input in agriculture. But this problem has been essentially solved by my colleagues Zayer Khan and John Pickett and others working with them in Eastern Africa and uh, Kenya. And here, this is just showing you a, a field of sorghum with striga growing in it, and the CI is diminished. But what they found is there's a legume called desmodium, and if you interplant the sorghum with desmodium, this prevents the striga from germinating, and it and it essentially protects the sorghum or the corn against against um, striga or this parasitic weed, which is which is devastating to those crops. And this, the, why this works is that this, this desmodium, this legume, produces these flavonones, these compounds that it, it exudes into the soil from its roots that actually cause the strigoses to uh, germinate and commit suicide because when they germinate there, they can't attack to the desmodium to the uh, desmodium roots, and so basically, it it causes suicidal germination of the striga seed. And over a period of time, this just shows you several years' time where the desmodium was planted, and they look at sigum, striga seed density in the soil, and you can see that where they had the desmodium planted, eventually the, the uh, number of striga seeds in the soil diminished considerably here, from almost from 75 to 100, or almost none over the period of time. Whereas if you're growing maize and you didn't have desmodium, and it, the striga seeds continued to increase. So it looks like this desmodium could be planted with interplanted with corn. As this is what they developed. They developed this really interesting. I, call, I think it's an elegant system called push pull. So they interplant the corn with desmodium. This desmodium produces chemicals in the soil that that prevents the striga from growing, and at the same time it produces chemicals that uh, repels the adult moths. And so the moths are repelled from the cornfield are deterred from entering the cornfield or staying in the cornfield. The striga is, is deterred from or prevented from germinating and, and or it's caused to germinate and then not get uh, not grow. 
and then around the edges of the field they produce, they produce some native grass and this grass has evolved with the moths and everything in, in Africa and when they it attracts the moths out to the edges of the field and there are the natural enemies which have evolved to find the moths on this grass are very effective at killing uh, knocking down or the population of the moths so here you have a system where you can prevent the, the um, parasitic weed, you can repel the moths and you can pull them out to the sides of the field to these where the native grass where the natural enemies will find them and this is very effective and this just shows you an example here of results where they had the uh, plots of maize and sorghum and the yield, increase in yield where they had uh, planted, you were using this push-pull system here and this is uh, kilograms per hectare versus the control where they did not have this push-pull system and also the same thing in sorghum. So this works very well and it's, and it's, and it's not only do you, you, this is just a cartoon showing how it works, but not only do you have more higher yield, less pest problems with plant, pest plants, parasitic plants and insects, but also you have this forage, you have this native grass around the outside, so at the end of the season they can cut this grass and feed it to their livestock. So it basically it has benefits many different ways. And now they're trying to uh, adapt this to because, because of climate change develop uh, push-pull technology with using maybe finding different plants, different plants besides desmodium that can be used for uh, companion planting and used in the push-pull system. Just this is just to show you some of the benefits. So it, it not only it has the empowerment of farmers because it also well, promotes gender equality and social equality because a lot of the farmers in Africa are women. The, the desmodium, the legume is interplanted, actually introduces, adds nitrogen to the soil, so that improves the soil health. You get increased fodder production to feed to the livestock, the cattle, and so forth. You protect, increase crop yields, and increase household income. So this has been a huge boon to agriculture and to food production in East Africa. And this, this slide is actually a couple of years old. By now, over 100,000 smallholder farmers in East Africa are using this system to protect their crops and to grow corn. So it's been highly successful and rapidly adapted, by the, taken up and, and accepted by the farmers in Africa. And it's, it's, I think it's a really unique and, and interesting demonstration of how you can use chemical ecology to, to protect plants. Well, that's looking at above ground, but you know there's just as much going on below ground in crop production and in plants as there is above ground. Ted Turnick's done a lot of nice work on nematodes, and the problem is is that and there's uh, it's an insect called Diabrotica vergifera, vergifera, which is a western corn rootworm, which is a huge pest of corn in the United States. But in the United States, they apply a lot of insecticides to the soil to, to to deter this insect and kill this insect before they plant the corn. But this was discovered, invaded, invaded uh, Europe. It was discovered in, in Belgrade, Serbia, in 1992. And this is an, for the Europeans, this is an invasive species, and it's a big problem. Now, it does have natural enemies. The larvae have natural enemies, which are nematodes, which are these small worms, which you can actually uh, attack these larvae and kill these larvae. And they've been used in, uh, effectively in, in many cases, but here again, it's sometimes a hit or miss situation. So the question is, can you find out how the worms find their host larvae and do they respond to these uh, western corn rootworm larvae uh, on corn roots? And so they set up an experiment like this where you have this olfactometer, six-arm olfactometer, and you have corn seedlings planted in three of the arms. This, this arm has uh, larvae on it, and uh, this, this caterpillar, this corn plant, the roots are just 
mechanically damaged, and this plant is undamaged, and then you have three blanks here, and they release the nematodes in the middle and see where they go. And what they found out was that more of them went to the ones of the larvae, which is this one here, than to the damaged or the undamaged plant. So it looks like that if you have the, the rootworm larvae feeding on the roots, that the, the, the nematodes can find those plants that are being attacked by uh, western corn rootworm larvae. The question is, how do they do that? Well, if you look at the volatiles produced by the roots, what you find is that the ones that are have caterpillars feeding on them are actually producing volatile organic compounds that diffuse through the soil and that the nematodes can use to, to track as cues to locate the, the plants on which their hosts are feeding. And here's a, one of the main cues here is so a sesquiterpene called caryophylline. So they injected caryophylline into the soil and did the same experiment and they found again that the nematodes were attracted to caryophylline. So then the question is though, not all plants produce caryophylline when they're fed on by, by uh, the corn rootworm, or they don't produce large amounts or equivalent amounts. This just shows you three different varieties of corn, and this one here called graft produces a lot more caryophylline. This one produces very little. So is there any way to if you wanted, for some reason, to grow this plant, how could you? How, what could you do to enhance its ability to be protected by nematodes? And what they found out was that they could actually genetically modify these plants, insert the gene for this synthesis of caryophylline into these corn plants. And this is, in my opinion, uh, genetically mod genetic modification of plants in a good way. You're not putting a toxin or anything else in them. You're just enhancing or increasing or introducing a gene to produce a compound that they'd normally produce anyway. They were able to do this and show that those plants that they introduced the gene into did produce caryophylline in the roots when they were attacked by the corn rootworm larvae. And so they did a, a study in the field. And here, this is just to give you an idea of the experimental setup. So here you have the release um, nematodes down in the middle here. And you have uh, diabrotica eggs uh, on these uh, here, so you, the corn rootworm eggs will hatch, and the larvae will feed on the plants. And then you you can look at their attraction to transform plants or to isogenic plants. And here's what they found: root damage was greatly decreased in the transform plants compared to the control, and the number of diabotica beetles was greatly reduced in the transformed plants compared to the control. So this actually does work in the field. You can actually modify the plants and get them to produce the attractants that attract the nematodes to kill the larvae. Well, there's another case where, where uh, rootworms have been a serious pest, and this also involves a, a an invasive species. This is a an insect called Diaprepes abbreviatus. It was introduced into Florida in 1964. And it's a real problem on citrus tree roots because the beetle larvae, the beetles lay their eggs in, around the citrus trees, although they attack a wide range of plants and the larvae damage the roots. And it's estimated that they cost $70 million damage annually in the agriculture. And here it shows the, the larvae and shows some of the damage and they actually on the roots and they actually burr, uh, girdle a tap root. So this is a real serious problem for the Florida citrus scores. And uh, uh, nematodes have been used for citrus scores for over 20 years, but here again, if you release the nematodes, you put them in the field and so forth, the question is how well do they work? And again, efficacy can range from zero to 90 percent. So sometimes they work really well and when they don't. So how can you enhance the effectiveness of these endomophagous nematodes to see if you can get them to protect, take out the uh, larvae and protect the trees? And this work was done by a group in uh, Citrus Research Center in Lake Alfred, led by uh, Lukasz Jelinski, Hans Auburn at the USDA ARS in Gainesville, Florida, and Jared Ali, among other people. And so what they did was they found that nematodes actually 
were attracted to diapreppies infested plants compared with non-infested plants. And uh, the nematodes were attracted to infested plants compared to just larvae alone. So if they did a bioassay where they gave them a choice of infested plants versus just larvae alone, they chose infested plants. Are infested plants over mechanical damage or control? So obviously there's something in the infested plants, there's something being produced by the roots of the infested plants that are attracting the nematodes. And the question again is, what is that compound and can, or compounds and can it be used? These are chromatograms here showing a chromatogram of volatiles collected from infested roots, just citrus roots alone, or just larvae alone. And what you see is there are three peaks here are cluster peaks that show up in the ones infected by citrus, by the larvae, larval infested roots that you don't see in the uninfested roots or larvae alone. And these were, this compound here, which is the most attractive, was identified as pregyrene. And, they could, and so then they tested this pregyrene to see if it was attractive to the nematodes. And in fact, it's very attractive to nematodes. It actually works in the field. They can put pregyrene in the cages in the field and pull in the nematodes inside the cages or even in the soil or surrounding that, that area. So wherever they put this compound, they get an increase in, in, uh, in, uh, in nematodes. This is nematodes per 500 cubic centimeters of soil. So you can see the differences here. So obviously this is a, one of the key chemicals that the nematodes use to find the the larvae on infested roots of the citrus tree, and the question is, can you use it to attract, attract uh, nematodes? And the answer is yes. They were successful in identifying in this induced cue. They showed that it attracts the nematodes and works in the field. And the, now the, what they're working on is develop a future application of this and how they can use it to uh, to benefit the citrus scores and to protect the trees from uh, from the from the rootworm larvae. Well, to summarize, plants are capable of defending themselves against insect herbivores, pathogens, parasites, and other uh, enemies. They have a really broad array of chemical defenses. A lot of this has been bred out of the plants because much of the crop breeding has been done looking at yield only under a pesticide umbrella and not looking at the defenses. But this, some of this could be put back in by genetic modification. And, and that's been demonstrated. And, and the, if you can do that, or if you can use companion planting as the, the people have done in Kenya, it's obvious that this can be a formidable defense and it, can, and it can be very effective in many different situations. But what you really need to do is you, we have to understand all these plant defensive mechanisms and different systems and they're not going to be the same everywhere. So it's very important to do the research to understand this. But in doing so, we can develop more sustainable, effective management of insect pathogens and thus reduce the inputs to agriculture, produce better food, cleaner food, and particularly in developing nations, this should be very valuable and helpful in food production. Well, I thank you for your attention, and I want to thank you know, all these people here who provided me slides. Most of the work I talked about today, or a lot of it wasn't the work out of my lab, but it came from various people all over the world. And I thank all these people for providing slides and let me talk about their work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. That was a very, very interesting talk. Um, so that concludes the presentation portion of the seminar. Jim will now take any questions. Thank you very much. We'll start with our first question. Our first question is from Laura McConnell. And she asks, do you think that the plants require a photolytic reaction to form some of the defensive compounds released during the day in cotton plants? Or are they all likely enzymatic reactions? Well, it, all, it is driven by photosynthesis. <laughs> you can see this easily by growing plants under higher light, you get more volatiles. And you know, this is basically if you put
put them on a the lamp bench and you don't have adequate light, you don't get as much volatiles as you do if you put them in a growth chamber where you have grow lights. Uh, it's not completely controlled by photosynthesis. I mean, the photosynthesis is obviously how it's made and how the precursors are produced and carbon is fixed and so forth and so on. And we showed that by actually using um, labeled carbon dioxide and feeding, uh, uh, exposing the plants to labeled carbon dioxide and showed that the plants very rapidly incorporated the label into the, the terpenes and sesquiterpenes. But also, it is possible that, that there are some precursors available, and in some of our experiments we've seen that even in the dark, plants will start to produce these compounds. But the other thing that happens is that a lot of these compounds are produced inside the leaves and not on the surface of the leaves. So even if they're produced inside the leaves, they're not really released until, until the stomata open in the daytime. And the stomata, the little pores on the plant leaves that are uh, very important for for the taking in uh, carbon dioxide and, rele and re emitting oxygen and, and transpiration and so forth and so on. So the short answer is yes, photosynthesis is very important to the produce production of these volatiles. Thank you. Next question is from Jack Horvath. Jack says, my dad was a cotton farmer. Then cotton production was taken away from the U.S. by other countries like Mexico and Egypt. Are they using this pheromone technology to control the boll weevils? Well, I don't think Egypt has boll weevils. Boll weevil is native to Central America, uh, and it actually was an invasive species. It wasn't in the U.S. until about 1910, about 100 years ago. It began to invade the U.S. and spread across the southern U.S. and infested all the continent. And with the eradication project, it's been moved out of the U.S. and push back into Mexico and actually now out of Mexico. Yes, they are using the pheromone in Mexico. And I think they're producing it also in South America. Uh, next question is Giselle Jansen asks, terpenes have been used successfully in repelling killing insects nematodes. How many insect parasites are likely to be attracted by these compounds? Uh, <laughs> How many, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, how many parasites are likely to be, you mean how many different species and so forth and so on, or? That's how I more? understand it. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, certainly we've seen a lot of different par uh, wasps, parasitic wasps, predators and so forth attracted to these terpenes. Uh, Nematodes, we've seen nematodes in two different areas attracted to these compounds, but there's not, that's not the total story. I mean, there are other compounds that attract and affect nematode uh, reproduction and so forth and so on. So, uh, But they are highly attractive to a broad array of, of, of nematodes and insects. Okay. Stephen um, Skillman says, excellent presentation, thank you. How reliable is host plant defense? Plants can also switch off their defense mechanisms. How can we ensure that defense is maintained? Well, plants switch on their defense mechanisms when they're attacked by herbivores. And they don't normally switch, have them switched on unless they're attacked because defense requires energy. So, I mean, if, if they're not attacked, they can put all their resources into growth and, and reproduction. But uh, normally, nearly all plants that I've seen, all those, some of the um, plants that have been bred for high yields don't have nearly the, uh, as I showed, don't have nearly the resources for defense as the natural plants or the native or the wild plants. But basically, that's what plants do. They don't switch on their, their uh, defenses until they're attacked, and then when they're attacked, they just switch on their fences and use. And they can, in many cases, they can uh, target the the pest insects and switch them on, uh, depending on which insect they have. They have excuse me, specific in the defenses against very specific predators or herbivores. I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure. If not, Stephen, you can type something in, and we'll we'll. Uh... Uh, ask him another question. In the meantime, John Beck has asked, he says, hi, great talk, thank you. Was a biopesticide discovered from the Striga project? 
Was which pesticide? Was any a biopesticide discovered from the Striga project? I don't think so. No, hmm. from the Striga. I don't think so. Uh, the Desmodium produces those flavonones and compounds that actually uh, cause suicidal germination of the Striga seeds, but I don't think any pesticides. The, the volatiles that the Desmodium plant produces that repel the insects are very similar to the volatiles produced by the plant when it's fed on by caterpillars, so this would naturally repel the female moths. Um, Thomas Potter asks, can you comment about connections between plant volatiles emissions and plant environmental stress? Well, plants that are stressed do produce volatiles. We've seen that. Uh, so they're, you know, this is one of the things that uh, they, they can uh, produce uh, volatile organic compounds. They will produce volatile organic compounds when there's stressed, uh, cold stress apparently induce them to produce some volatiles. Uh, there's a lot we don't know about <coughs> what causes plants to produce defenses. Mainly we've been looking at re reaction to herbivore damage and things like this. But yes, other stresses definitely cause volatile production by plants. And we don't really understand the role of volatiles in that case. And I would also add that not they don't necessarily produce all the same volatiles in, in response to stress like heat or cold or drought as they do to herbivore damage. But yes, they do produce volatiles. So a lot more yet to be discovered. John Beck, who asked about the uh, biopesticide discovered from the Striga project, asks, along those lines, desodium project, was an actual repellent of the stem borer discovered? Yes, that was published by uh, Pickett and Zayer Khan. I can't remember exactly where they, but they did. They identified. I'm, I think, and I can't remember exactly. I think it was some terpenes that the Desmodium produced. They were similar to what was produced by the corn when it was fed on by the insects. But the Desmodium just produced it and released it into that, without damage, as I understand it from what I read in the literature. Uh, Don Walkup um, asks, we have serious invasive insect issues in forests. Any work being done in these systems, for example, hemlock, woolly, aldigid? Probably didn't say that correctly. Uh, I've never figured out how to pronounce that either. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of work being done on emerald ash borer and the wood wash, we've done some work in that. A lot of people are working on this. This is These are been really tough projects. I don't know that, I mean, there have been some attractants identified, but they haven't been highly effective. We did some work on the Cyrex wood wasp, and we identified some tree attractants that attracted the wasp. But as far as control, this, but to be honest, this doesn't seem to have had much success so far. Now, of course, there's a world of work was done by Wood and Silverstein way back 40, 50 years ago, and, and by others since then on uh, bark beetle pheromones and bark beetle attractants to uh, pines and other uh, trees, particularly in the west, in the Rockies, and so forth and so on. So there's been a lot of work done on this, and and they have been used in, in various ways. But I don't, I don't think forests. It's a completely different situation if you've got to try to control uh, pests in a forest area. So they are there. They have been identified. They have been used particularly for monitoring. I'm not sure how effective they are. Um, I think this is our last question. Stephen Skillman asks, ABA and SA pathways will switch off JA pathways, resulting in loss of host plant protection parentheses, crosswalk. How can we overcome this? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, that's true. And, and actually, the interesting thing is that some insect species produce, uh, Dr. Gary Felton has shown, some insect species produce glucose oxidase, which triggers an SA pathway, which tends to, because of the crosstalk, uh, reduce the J production. Uh, this is an ongoing this, I mean, this is an ongoing uh, situation with the with the 
uh, interactions of wars between the herbivores and the plants. The plants develop defenses, the herbivores try to develop uh, to overcome those defenses, and it varies with different species and so forth and so on. Uh, I'm not sure how you're going to overcome that, but that's something, that's an area that is getting a lot of attention right now and a lot of research. Uh, but, you know, I don't know the answer to the question. It's just a short answer to that. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you, Jim. That was very interesting, and thank you, audience, for your attention. On behalf of the ACS Agro Division, I'd like to thank Jim, as well as our sponsor for this webinar series, ABC Laboratories. 